In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. What is your most desperate prayer? What is your most desperate prayer? Do you have an ailment that is physically painful, life-threatening, limits the way that you can live your life? Are you worried about a loved one who is suffering from mental health issues or substance use issues? Are you struggling with how to pay your bills or is your marriage utterly lonely and you wonder how you can be true to yourself and also true to that relationship? What, what is your most desperate prayer? What would you pray to God if you believed God was listening, God loves you, and God answers your prayer? I have been desperate. Every single one of us has been desperate at one time or another. Sometimes it feels like we've been desperate for so long it is hard to imagine anything will ever change. We are like the hemorrhaging woman who for 12 years, 12 years, suffered from physical pain, financial strain, and the social isolation of an incurable illness. Sometimes our desperation is imminent or acute like when a loved one is in an accident, and then we are like Jairus pleading for immediate relief. We all have desperate prayers. We are the hemorrhaging woman. We are Jairus. We are even the community pressing in on Jesus, trying to get closer and closer to the one who we know can heal us. I have been thinking about those people in the crowd pressing in as he is preaching and teaching. Yes, the woman was healed. Yes, the little girl was restored to her family. And what about all of those other people in the crowd? What happened to them? What happened to their prayers? Not every desperate prayer is answered in the way we desire. Sometimes from our vantage point, it looks like they are not answered at all. This is one of the painful and challenging issues of faith, to stay in relationship with a God who seems to not answer our cries. How could God answer some prayers and not others? Did Jesus love the hemorrhaging woman and Jairus' daughter more than all of the others? These questions take us to the precipice of our limited ability as human beings to know fully the ways of God. We are like Job on the dung heap crying out for relief. Life is a mysterious mixture of joy and sorrow, love and hurt. As I have pondered this scripture from Mark, I am aware not only of desperate prayers, I am also aware, thankfully, of answered prayers. Years ago, I was having a conversation with a woman who was going through really hard and painful divorce for a very long time. We were standing in the nave of a church just like this. We were in front of the altar having this conversation, and with tears in her eyes, she asked me, why isn't God listening to me? Frankly, I was wondering the same for her this good and gentle and kind and loving woman. I don't know, 
I replied. I really don't know. But it seems to me that the scriptures tell us the desolation of Holy Saturday was only one day, that one day when those who loved Jesus felt utterly abandoned, they could not feel his presence, their despair was overwhelming. Sadly, I said to this beautiful woman, I think you are in the midst of a years-long Holy Saturday. We are a people of hope, I continued, and I pray your Easter will soon come. Her Easter, her answer to prayer did come, but not immediately. It was a long time. Eventually, she healed from the wounds of that painful marriage. She learned her part in the pain that had been inflicted. She was restored years later in a new and healthy and kind relationship with another. And, my, and her life is not perfect. I spoke recently with someone who has been in an arduous and long battle with cancer. From the wisdom of her suffering, she told me that as angry and desperate and despondent as she feels at times, this illness has also given her an opportunity to be more grateful than she was before. I was surprised by this. And she said, I wake up without a headache and I give thanks. She said, how can I know to be grateful for the good days if I have never had the hard ones? Wow. Her faith, her wisdom, wow. That inspires me. Often when I am with her, I feel as if she is an answer to my prayers. This person is not a member of St. Stephen's, but she's been on our prayer list. Did you know that one of the ways we minister to others is that we have a card guild? Do you know about this ministry? It's a really important and wonderful ministry. And if you want to be a part of it, let Sally know. So what this card ministry does is they take the list of the people who are on our prayers and they get together and they pray for those people and then they send out cards and the cards have on them the signature of all of the people on the, the card guild. I've received this after my mother died. It was so beautiful to see all those names on a card and to know I had been prayed for. And my friend said to me, when I opened the card from your church and knew all of those people were praying for me, I cried. I just cried. They don't even know me. And they are praying for me? She also said that amidst the horrors and indignities of her illness, for the first time in her life, she could physically feel, emotionally feel, truly and spiritually feel receiving the prayers of others. And for that, she is incredibly grateful. At the crucible of her suffering, she has encountered all-encompassing love. And you, my friends, have been a part of that. Her cancer is not gone. Her pain is not gone. She has really bad days where she is angry. And yet, like the hemorrhaging woman, she can faithfully continues to reach out for healing. Like Jairus, she reminds Jesus that she is standing right here and she's not going anywhere till she gets a response. And like David in our psalm today, she waits for God. Her soul waits for God more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. She waits for God. When Jesus restored the hemorrhaging woman to wholeness, he also restored her to community. You know this more than likely, but when she was continuously bleeding, oh, we've got to pass back that ring or whatever. <laughs> 
just came rolling on down. Are we good? You got it? All right, we're good. Sorry to embarrass you. And you are on camera. When Jairus restored the hemorrhaging woman to wholeness, he also restored her to community. Because you, you do probably know this, but when in the purity code of that time, if you were bleeding in that way, you were separated from community. You couldn't be touched. You were an untouchable. So not only did he heal her physically, he healed her emotionally by actually recommitting her to community. And when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, he restored her to her family and apparently to a meal together afterwards. My friends, we are not only individuals seated in these pews, each of us carrying our own desperate prayers, each of us carrying our prayers for thanksgiving. We are the body of Christ. Our faith and our work for the sake of the gospel is a communal pursuit. As we ask for healing in our lives and the healing of the world, there are two things of many which we know do participate in the co-creation with God of the kingdom of God here on earth. And one of those things is to support and participate in community. And the other is to follow the practices of the tradition. Our thoughts are not God's thoughts, and we do not always know God's ways. It is very hard when we feel God is not answering our prayers. And yet, with the faith that God loves us, we can reach out not only to touch the hem of Jesus' robe, we can reach out to and for one another for the sake of community. We can pray for our needs and the needs of our, even our unknown brothers and sisters. And so to that end, I commend to you the practice of taking home the prayer list. Did you know that our bulletin includes the prayer list every single Sunday? I know some of you do this. So take that's why we're out of bulletins. <laughs> they listened at 8 o'clock. I just thought of that. That's pretty cool. Sorry, people. Okay, so uh, take those bulletins home and pray for those people at least one time this week. Maybe break it up into sections day by day. It's a lot of names. And here's something else. For the kids who are here or the people who have children in your lives, Show them that list and perhaps not do every single name because I just don't know who could, what child could possibly do that. There might be some. But just chunk it out and take a few names and explain why we pray for other people. Help them to feel a sense of community right now, as young as they are. You know, it takes courage and humility to ask for prayer. So let's answer those prayers. And if you are in a place of desolation and desperate prayer in your life right now, I'm standing here as a representation of this whole community to say, we are so very sorry you're hurting. We are so very sorry that you are hurting in any way at all. I assure you, God loves you. I assure you, God is listening to you. I encourage you, keep reaching out. And along those lines, please reach out to Catherine or Sally or me if you need a partner in prayer with you. And if it feels safe to you, perhaps something else we could do is to help restore you to a small community that might support you in whatever it is that you're going through. And for those who have experienced the answer to prayer, myself included, I encourage us to give thanks and to live out that thanks by as best we can being an answer to prayer for others 
In all of this, I pray we will have the faith to ask God for what we need and to trust that God is listening. And in conclusion, I'm throwing a curveball to Natalie and to Whitney, who's given me a face, and to the choir. I'm going to ask everybody, but you guys are so good, you can do this. Okay, so when, you were, when we were singing hymn 707, I thought that first verse would be a beautiful way for us to close this reflection on Mark's gospel. So I'm going to, we're good? All right, so you figure it out. <laughs> Thank you. And, we'll, and you can remain seated if you want. Let's do that. Just verse one. Thank you. Thank you. Amen.